Today is Sunday, March 7th, 2021. I have been talking or trying to get into mental prayer a little bit more so that you may continue on the path to holiness, the path of divine union. And I talked a couple weeks ago about a priest whose book I found again. His name, and I didn't mention his name. His name was Father John Aaron Terrell. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Aaron Terrell? A-R-I-N-T-E-R-O. He was a Dominican born in the 19th century. He died in 1928. And he wrote a, a... He had a conversion in the middle of his life, as I mentioned, because he started hearing the confessions of sisters in the convent, and especially one of them, which I found this book yesterday, amongst the books that I'm going through. This is a book on him, it's his letters that he wrote to this. She was the mother superior for a while in the convent, and the two of them met about five years before he died, and he met quite a few from this convent and the next day he came back and he said to the Mother Superior, I need to talk to the sister that I saw last. And she noticed too, right when she met him, that there was something unusual about him that she needed to speak with him. And she could see that they had something in common and that he could probably help her. As she has an interesting life it appears great graces that God sent her from early in early in her life so that she might become a a deep interior soul and reach some high levels of mystic prayer. They met and she was almost weeping when he came back and asked for her. She was because she wanted to speak to him. And he said, I needed to speak to you. So, it was an interesting relationship that began at that time, and he was directing her by many letters. Most of the letters in here are from her. They don't have all his correspondence anymore, but a lot of letters are in here. And I was reviewing some of this, and it appeared to me when I was reading some of his manual, he has a book called, it's called the mystical evolution that he wrote. He wrote about 40 books. And he was very big in writing for a magazine at that time. There was a lot of problems. There were a lot of problems at that time in the church already beginning. Pope St. Pius X wrote about many things, as you know, about modernism beginning and you can see in his letters when he talks to this Mother Superior that he was fighting some of the things that were going on back then. He was a very busy man. Very busy. And very holy. But I want to mention a few things which is pertinent to prayer and what we've talked about from other authors and I thought they were good to hear. He says in one of his letters to her. I'm trying to see what this was on August 15th, 1923. He says, in regard to some book on the mystical, mystical life, it's in Spanish probably, which Monsignor Volpe requested. The book is being translated by one of our fathers in Rome, but since it will take him a long time, he has summarized the most essential parts These show that the mystical life is for all, because all those who thirst are invited by our Lord to the mystical waters, each one in his own time and in his own way. Everyone should not follow the same formula, but each one should obey his director. The evil is that some directors close the door instead of helping the soul to enter. And he talks a little bit more about that. But even in his day, this was a hundred years ago, that 
Not a lot of directors understood, it appears, the pause of the interior life. And they wouldn't always help souls that were starting to progress from mental prayer to the next stages. And unfortunately, in 1923, he also wrote another letter to her a little earlier that year. He makes a comment which I thought might be worth mentioning in this paragraph. Nevertheless, in asking you to be as simple as a dove and at the same time prudent as a serpent with God's representatives in whom God himself inspires your confidence, I feel obliged to be the same in regard to you, confident that our Lord will give you the grace to keep an absolute reserve. And I must add, my daughter, to my confusion that because of my sins, laxity, and lukewarmness, in spite of speaking and writing so much about mysticism and feeling myself attracted to it and being convinced, I don't know by what light or superior power, that in general what I have written is the truth, in spite of rejoicing to see that this has done good for many souls and being disposed to make any sacrifice to perform this service for them and thus give glory to God in spite of my continued conviction that if we are slow to attain those graces, it is only through our own fault. I regret very much to tell you with all sincerity that I have not yet experienced the grace of intimate union with God or even perhaps the moment of the prayer of quiet. My best prayer is he says, he quotes from the Old Testament, I am become as a beast before thee. And in order that I understand this well, the Lord frequently permits a spirit like that which tormented you recently for a few days to persecute me tenaciously and without my experiencing the abhorrence that I should. He says, he talks about himself, I see that I am nothing but a donkey which Our Lady uses to carry pure souls to our Lord, and I rejoice in that. I could hardly be admitted to his loving presence, since I must always remain in the courtyard or in the corral. Now, I kind of mention it because, not to discourage you, but I did mention that many times, that the path to holiness, the path of this road, to higher levels of prayer. He says again, as Gary Gulagrange mentioned, the same thing, St. John of the Cross. Everyone is called to it. We all are. But we don't all make it. And this was five years before he died. So I'm hoping that before he died, that God gave him this grace. His cause went to Rome for beatification. I don't think he's been beatified yet, but they were working on it. And I'm hoping that he got to that point. The other thing, though, about him, if you read some of his letters, which I was doing, I didn't get through all of them, obviously, but I, I read some of them, and he could write, it appears, in his book about the summit and the path to holiness because of what he understood from the sisters that explained it to him. And so he had a love, as you could hear in his words, he had a love and a desire for it and a resignation to God's will. He had a humility that you could hear that was profound. And so maybe God, for his own reason, left him, as it says in the Canticle of Canticles, as one he let the soul search for him and he would peer through the lattices, it says in the book of Canticle of Canticles, at the soul. And God loves when a pure soul seeks for him, searches for him, and is anxious about trying to find him on the path of holiness. It moves God. Why he didn't give it to this prayer to him at this point in his life? in 1923, if what he says is, is exactly true. Maybe he was being a little bit humble. Maybe a little more humble than he needed to be. 
But he expressed it that way. And I don't know why. And I will never try to conclude why, but some of the other authors have talked about this same fact that many are, it appears, very ready for it, but they don't reach it. Is it because their life is so busy? That's what they ask. Their life is so filled with other things. And this man, he wrote 40 books. He wrote this and it appears was in charge to some degree with a some kind of a magazine that was put out probably on a monthly or bi-monthly basis at that time, trying to fight the errors, as I said, to try to teach the truth about mysticism. He wrote an article, and he talks about it in his letter, about how he tried to explain that what is called, and I've used the word because I've, I've read it in other authors, the, the expression of a, an acquired contemplation. He said that word, that, that phrase is wrong. That's what he says. It's wrong. There is no such thing as an acquired contemplation. If you understand what contemplation is and what it means to be acquired by ordinary grace. He says no. He said that's not a real phrase. Acquired recollection, yes. But not acquired contemplation. Which we will talk about some other time. So, the, the point is though, we shouldn't be discouraged. God calls everyone. As our Lord yelled out in the temple, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And that's what Father Aaron Toro was saying. Those words mean and imply that all those who have a desire, desire, a true desire, all those that do will reach it if they are generous, if they are faithful, if they will not let the things of the world get in their way. And as I said, I'm not speculating what the situation was with Father Arantaro. I could never do that. I'd be absolutely foolish. However, he was very much taken up with being a Dominican. Dominicans write. They write for people to understand the truth, to defend the, the faith, to defend the true path of holiness as he was trying to do in his day. It was being belittled. He said other authors are saying that holiness in this way is not for everyone. He was trying to combat that. And in a sense, I don't know, but almost seemed to be a losing battle the way things have progressed in the last hundred years. But not that it's a complete loss, no. But we have not... For a while the church was progressing. I've read in other manuals too that in the, in the 20th century there was a, an interest in the interior life that started to spur. But I don't know if it's continued I would say it hasn't. It's the, the church is very much into the church. The people are very much into the material aspect, the externals, not so much of the contemplative life as they used to be. But our Lord calls everyone. And what I'm wondering, what has gone through my head this week as I've considered some of the topics that I've been trying to go over, which, as I mentioned, are very difficult. The, the point I want to make today, and I'm going to try to express in more detail about mental prayer, for example. I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that I haven't discouraged you, anyone, from understanding, the, in a sense, the simplicity of mental prayer. The, the beauty of it. The ease in which a soul should come to it. I have talked about difficulties regarding prayer. Yes, the difficulties are, are the, the change of life to some degree in order to make life foster in regards to the interior life. Because what happens, our lives are very busy in this day and age. Very busy. As I mentioned before, how companies are making work and putting extra work on each of the individuals that remain in their companies in order to get more out of them. 
and people are working very many hours in order to keep up a career. There are problems in families. There are difficulties with just raising a family in this day and age. Sending children to the right school, for example. Protecting them from evil of our days. Very difficult. But if a soul will do the first part, which I'm trying to explain now, and it has to do with the mortification and some penance, some mortification from the point of view of correcting our will, of bringing our will more in, in, in line with God's will in all things, in the littlest details of life, the littlest resignation to God's will, even in something like the spilling of a glass of milk. Resignation to God. So be it. Even in those little things. Those little things are the things that are very helpful to the practice and the habit of mortification. The, the habit of accepting of God's will in all things. The big and the little. And in regards to a very difficult aspect, I would say, of mental prayer, is not the prayer itself. The prayer is simple. And as you will find in many books on mental prayer, I didn't bring them today, but I have some slides on it, regarding mental prayer, the authors often talk about, and I know some of you have read them, and you see that this one says, prepare your subject the night before. This one says, have this prepared. Have an idea of what you want to gain from your mental prayer. And, all. and there are a lot of rules. And they put them out there just to give some basic guidance. But don't hamper God. Don't hamper God's Spirit, the Holy Ghost. If you feel inclined to pray at any one time, and you feel inclined in a certain way, and it doesn't match what these authors are saying, don't let it bother you. Follow your, your, the feeling of your heart. It is good to use, use those things at the very beginning, yes. And to get some idea of how to go through the steps of mental prayer. The, the preparation for prayer. I've talked about many times. Especially the difficult one, which I, it's the difficult one, is the remote preparation. As I talked about last week. The remote preparation to keep myself from things in life, even though they are perfectly acceptable, and there are no, nothing in, them, in themselves, there's nothing evil about them, nothing wrong, imprudent with them. Some of them actually necessary when you're raising a family and living, an, in a sense, a normal life. That There's a lot of different definitions of what a normal life is, so I use that word loosely. But you have to live your life, yes. But avoid those things as I mentioned last week, avoid those things which become distractions from your interior voice, the in interior spirit that dwells in your soul. You are the temple of God. So, for example, to give you an idea, that type of thing, to me, is the hard part. Those are the difficult things. In preparing yourself to pray well and to start if you haven't started already, or to continue and to progress on the path of prayer, path to union with God, which is, according to St. John, Father Aaron Terrell, Gary Goulagrange, some of the greatest authors we've had, St. Teresa of Avila, we are all called to it. We are all called. So, the difficult part, it appears, is to understand what things in my life prevent and may hamper me from becoming a saint, from treading the path of holiness. On this book, he put, they put a mountain, a very steep mountain, and he says, towards the heights of union with God. As St. John of the Cross, it probably comes from St. John of the Cross, who drew his mountain with the three paths that lead up it and only one reaching the summit. And he explains all about it. But to understand, for example, some of the things 
that I thought I would just point out some of the passages in Scripture, just a few, especially for this time of the year. Right before it, it appears, or very close to the time of our Lord's Passion, he gave the parable of the Good Shepherd, the story. I am the Good Shepherd, he said. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. But the hireling, who is not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches and scatters the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine and mine know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. And he points out there as well, in that same passage, the fact that he lays down his life on his own, for us. This is God, our Lord. He so loved the world, God the Father, so loved the world, he sent his only Son to redeem us. Another passage in chapter 14. Do you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? He who believes in me, the works that I do, he also shall do, and greater than me shall he do, because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name I will do, in order that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to dwell with you forever, the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You shall know him, because he will dwell with you and be in you. This is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He is in your soul. And, if you don't mind, if you abide in me, this is in chapter 15 of St. John's Gospel, if you abide in me, and if my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done to you. In this is my Father glorified, that you may bear very much fruit and become my disciples. Now, he's speaking to all of us. This isn't just the apostles. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. As I also have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. And the last, most, in a sense, the most beautiful one, is from the book of the Apocalypse. And this is from chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. I counsel thee to buy of me gold refined by fire, that thou mayest be rich and mayest be clothed in white garments, and that the shame of thy nakedness may not appear, and to anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As for me, those whom I love, I rebuke and chastise. That's part of the path to holiness. Our Lord has to correct us. That's for those who have started up the path of holiness, as the authors teach us, and they get to a certain point of the initial mortification and acts of little penance, refinement of themselves, to try to correct themselves so that God may lead them to the highest levels of divine union. We must do at the beginning what God expects of us with ordinary grace. I've mentioned that. And these authors speak about it. After that, if God starts to raise the soul, he realizes with everyone, he needs to purge it himself. You can't do it alone. He needs to help you purge it. But we have to prepare for it. As for me, those whom I love, I rebuke and chastise. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man listens to my voice and opens the door to me, I will come in to him and will step with him, and he with me. He who overcomes... I will permit him to sit with me upon my throne as I also have overcome and have sat with my father on his throne. Now, to me, 
these words of our Lord, it doesn't take much of a little peaceful time reflecting upon these most beautiful words of what our Lord is inviting us to. If anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. You will sit on my Father's throne with me. That's what our Lord told us in the book of the Apocalypse. This is what he's calling us to. It is most beautiful. And so, the part of the reason I mention is because this, if you think about this, and you understand a little bit about the, the, the basic steps that they recommend for mental prayer, just reading these passages, reflecting upon them, understanding that the, the Holy Ghost dwells in your soul at the time that you are praying, the heart melts, in a sense, with love for God. That's what he wants. My son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. That, I believe, is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 23. My son, give me your heart. Mental prayer is not difficult. Mental prayer is so easy. It's like a young couple who fall in love. Do they find it difficult to be with each other? I hope not. You wouldn't expect it. It's the same with God. The beautiful thing about God is you don't have to, in a sense, worry about what you say in your prayer. Just let your heart speak. He's willing to listen to anything. He wants to hear your sorrows. He wants to hear. You ask for him to come. There's a beautiful story I just read the other day. It was a different author than Father Aaron Terrell. He had been raised to at least divine contemplation. And he was praying. And somebody knocked at his door or whatever and asked him if he would hear somebody's confession. And for some reason, he said, I am occupied. I can't right now. Because he was praying, probably. And as soon as he said that, he lost the presence of God. And he began to weep. And he ran after the soul. It says in the book, he ran after that soul, striking his breast, asking God forgiveness. And he went and heard the confession of the, the young man. He thought, I'm not sure if it was a young man or a young lady. He heard the confession, consoled that soul greatly by what he did for them. And then, because he was pleading with God, please return, Lord, return. And he did. The Holy Ghost came back. Our Lord came back to him. But God wants generosity. He wants to be your friend. He wants to raise you to high level of holiness. And mental prayer is just the beginning. And it's not difficult. It is the easiest thing, in a sense, is to pray interiorly. But the preparation is a little bit difficult. For example, I need to spend at least, let's say, 20 minutes. If you can find 20 minutes of good free time each day. And usually, usually, people can do that. Sometimes you have to search where to find it. And where am I going to fit this in? I understand that everyone's life is a little different. But if you can find it, that time to be alone, and if you start to practice the mental prayer, which we will get into in time, if you start to practice that, what will happen is you will say, 20 minutes is not enough. 20 minutes is way too short. And some of the authors have spoken, some of the authors I have read, they have spoken about how they spend, let's say, at least an hour or two in their prayer. And they, let's say they were at the beginning of divine contemplation. I'm speculating. Because of what they said, the way they implied it. Because other authors speak about it differently. But these authors... They said, at least at one point in their life, they would spend 
an hour or two in their prayer before God would come in that unique way and make his presence felt. Now, not that we're all able to do that. I understand that. But we each have, as Father Aaron Terrell said, we each have our unique way. And it's a unique way that we have to try to understand and to try to fight for it. Fight to understand, as these authors have spoken, the one thing necessary is God and your path to God. You're not called just to ordinary, in a sense, ordinary holiness. Just an ordinary life of, I'm a lay person. That's for others. That's not the case. Think about it from the point of view of a mountain climber. Mountain climbers have a rough, a rough path. I've watched some things on mountain climbing the Mount Everest. I don't know how anyone in the right mind would want to do it. It's it's almost uh, it's almost suicide when you see some of the things that go on there when they try to climb that mountain. But they have to go through a lot to do that. But for some reason, they have a drive. I've read once that certain people, when they see a mountain, they've got to climb it. They just have this drive to want to overcome the obstacle. And all I will, I will answer, or I will finish with on that is, if we understood, as I spoke about, especially last year, many classes, if we understood the, the treasure at the top of the mountain, if you understand it, it will give you the drive to search for it. You will. You can't help it. If you understood what the goal is, God wants to bring you there. And he will, if you're generous. Now, I was on some of this before, and now I want to continue, because this gets in, and maybe a few slides next week, about related to this, about a little preparation, the mortification, idea of mortification, not asking or speculating that we need to do extraordinary penance like they did 500 years ago. No, not necessary. Often leads, as these authors speak about, often leads to problems, often leads to pride. If we try to do too much for our condition, we have a certain life we need to live. We have a responsibilities. We do. And to to ignore those responsibilities can often be detrimental to us and displeasing to God. So there's a balance. We have to find the right balance for each of our lives. But if we understand this and a little next week, and then I will go over the, the steps of mental prayer next week. I have them all listed here, and I thought I might do them today, but I want to finish with this instead. He says, this comes from Raoul Plu in his book of Praying Always. It is necessary to introduce into the mind a number of ideas and impressions which will be of use in prayer. Nothing will be of greater assistance than the fixed determination to come into daily close contact with God. To quote the words of the founders of the Abolates of the Sacred Heart, Louis Montenac. It is by accustoming our minds to make acts of love at regular moments that we shall learn the good habit of being able to turn to God at all times. That's what it's leading to. These souls that started on the path, sometimes it didn't take them too long if they were generous, that God would make his presence known and they could live with God always as he said last week, not Raoul Plu mentioned. Not everyone's called to become a semi-wayfarer, remember? Mention that? We're not all called, according to Father Aaron Taro and Gary Gould I think they would disagree with him on that point. It is by accustoming our minds to make acts of love at regular moments that we shall learn the good habit of being able to turn to God at all times it is a foolish mistake to expect to lead a recollected life that is not also a life of prayer. The best method of learning to pray always is to pray whenever it is possible and as well as possible. How to attain to this life? 
We must remember, first of all, that prayer depends especially on the grace of God. Hence, we prepare for it far less by processes which might remain mechanical than by humility, for God giveth grace to the humble, and he makes us humble in order to load us with his gifts. Now, that's, he makes a good point there, that there are many places, many different authors that speak about the, the different ways to practice mental prayer and the steps of mental prayer, which are good. But don't become hampered. Don't be, feel like you've got to follow those things. And for a while, try to follow them for a while. But eventually, hopefully, you'll become accustomed to prayer. You won't need all the steps necessarily. If your day is filled with prayer, from morning to night, in a sense, by the time you get to your night prayer, if you've tried to keep some recollection, some attention on God and the things of God, it will be easy in the evening to recollect yourself, to turn inwardly to God. And if you have avoided unnecessary distractions during the day, that may lead your mind to wonder, it will be a great help. To remind us of the necessity of humility and simplicity, or purity of intention, Christ said to his apostles, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, especially into the intimacy of the kingdom, or into the life of prayer. God himself is pleased to instruct immediately those who are truly humble of heart. Such was the peasant of ours, St. John Vianney, who remained for a long time in silence near the tabernacle, in intimate and wordless conversation with our Lord. If we love to be nothing, to accept contempt, and not only accept it, but end by loving it, we shall make great progress in prayer. We shall be loaded with gifts far beyond our desires. Preparation for the life of prayer depends not only on humility, but also on mortification, which is the spirit and practice of detachment from sensible things and from self. Now, this is what these authors are explaining. Father Aaron Terrell says the same thing. Clearly, if our minds are preoccupied with worldly interests and affairs, and our souls agitated by too human affection, by jealousy, by the memory of wrongs done us by our neighbor, or by rash judgments, we shall not be able to converse with our Lord. Now, when he says, preoccupied with worldly interests, the, the exception is, that, and the authors speak about it specifically, if you have an obligation, and you do that obligation prudently and properly, generously, you should do it well. For example, the work that you're being paid for, you must do it well. And they say, if you do it that way, it's an obligation and duty for you. If you do it well, it will not become a hamper. It will not be a detrimental to your life of prayer. But that takes great generosity. It takes Prudence, prudence, how to do it well, but to, not to so enter into our work that it becomes completely overwhelming to us, distracting from what is more important, if you understand the subtle difference. If in the course of the day we criticize our superiors or fail in docility toward them, when evening comes we shall hardly be likely to find the presence of God in prayer. Therefore, all inordinate inclinations must be mortified, so that charity may take the uncontested first place in our soul and rise spontaneously toward God in distress as well as in consolation. These inordinate inclinations must be mortified. That's what I talked about, mortifying and, in a sense, redirecting the will so that it is very docile to God. That's what penance and mortification during Lent are about. Not just the penance of feeling hungry and meriting because I've given up food at certain times or limited the amount during my day. And that has a reward in itself, yes. But it's to strengthen the will 
so that when inordinate inclinations are discovered that we have, we might have the strength of character to fix them. Alas, our great misfortune in prayer is that we know not how to treat with God as seeing him who is invisible, nor how to ask in faith nothing wavering. Although our Savior has solemnly promised, if you shall have faith and stagger not, and if you shall say to this mountain, Take up and cast thyself into the sea, it shall be done. Now those words, I believe, are words of our Lord. They're infallible. Now, we're not so much talking about a mountain on the hillside or in, in a country. We're talking about mountains that are in the way obstacles for me to reach the heights of holiness. There are mountains at the beginning. We have a lot to overcome. As I mentioned before, we have so much to overcome that we can't do it all ourselves. If we are to reach the summit of perfection, you can't. God will help you. So, when you ask, first thing you should ask for, pray for. Pray that God leads you to holiness, to the, the path of holiness through the interior life and a life of prayer. Beg it of our Lord. It's an infallible prayer, in a manner of speaking. Why? Because it's what God wants of you. He wants it of me. He wants us to become holy. He wants to lead us to the path of holiness. Down that path. Or up the mountain of holiness. He wants to. So the authors say, beg it of God. Pray for it. Make that your prayer. And if you are generous and faithful and respond to the little inspirations of the Holy Ghost that he will send you, you won't hear words. If you do, just mention them to your confessor and then forget about them. That's what St. John of the Cross says. But you won't hear words, normally. But the Holy Ghost will prompt you. As he said before in one of the previous slides, pray as often as you can during the day. If you feel called at a moment during the day that you can sneak and be away for a moment to say a prayer, to recollect your mind about God's presence in your soul. It is a great help. Follow that inspiration. Don't let it go to waste. It won't return. Those actual graces come and go. They don't return. And if you are faithful to those, as he said here, it will lead you. No doubt we must also pray with a lively sense of our misery and unworthiness for the prayer of the humble pierceth the clouds. And in the middle there, our Lord will have more glory in saving us. The gravity of our malady will show forth the wisdom of the divine physician. When a poor man has many misfortunes to plead his cause, it is then especially that he excites the compassion of the rich man and makes him open his hand. That's us before God. Bring your poverty to God. Show him the difficulties in your life of prayer. For example, Lord, help me dis to discover how to find a way around the difficulties I see in my path. Give me the time to give something to you each day. And next week, if you come back, which I hope you will, Next week, we will go over the, the steps, at least one outline of the steps of mental prayer again. I've done it a couple of years ago, but I will do it again real quickly just to show them. And today I was wanting to just express the fact that God invites all. And prayer is the easiest thing. The hardest thing is finding the change I, I need to make and then making it, correcting some of the things that are wrong in my life. And God, if you are generous, especially at the beginning, I can promise you, if you are generous at the beginning, He will let you know in a unique way. He will let you know that He's satisfied and happy with your gift of yourself. He will. And with that, I will let you go. 
so that you can get to Mass. So thank you for coming, and I hope I see you again soon. You're welcome.